What? I wanted to say this is an 18 plus only broadcast, and so you should yeah. edit that to the beginning. Howdy, folks. It is Monday, April 9th, 2012. This is the Bad Dog Book Club. I'm Skip Ruddertail, your Otter Editor, and with me, as always, is. Tunces and Skip doing a very helpful, like, pointing gesture so I know when to come in and say my name. It's good, you know, because we've only been doing this for over a year now, and I want to make sure. I'm just very unfocused. I might think that he's introducing somebody else in the room. It could be. Could be. What are we reading this week, Skip? <laughs> I voted uh, today. Yeah, this week, <laughs> the, this week we're reading Pyra Stringer's Secret. So we we did be a little misleading her because last week we said, or last episode, uh, we, we promised said we were going to read mouse porn. Yeah, we and promised straight, straight, straight. Porn. And well, Khaki Dog as you know, as our producer, he said he'd read the show for us this week, and he just kind of made one of these producer decisions right. at the last minute. He told me last night that, oh, I, 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 re- I recorded, or, you know, this, we're recording this a little advanced, guys, but he told me last <laughs> week uh, that, oh, I read, recorded Secret anyway. I decided to do that one. And well, it was like, why not? Whatever. Okay, right, whatever. We'll, we'll make do. Uh, I think we'd still both kind of like to do mouse porn maybe at some point, so maybe we'll, uh, Table that, that one fun. for a bit. Uh, I, thought, I just thought it would have been nice to, to throw a bone out there to our straight readers to do a I, dedicated straight story. I agree. Story, but... So, you know, if it, see how you feel about it, Pyro Stinger, but if you're equitable, we may, uh, who, who, we have we to may want to hang on to, to it for a little bit. We should bit. apologize to him before we start begging him for more stories. We because should. We did kind of surprise him. Yeah, i sorry. We both, I think we both thought the other person had contacted you saying we were going to run the story, so yeah. we dropped the ball there because of our music communication. So apparently... Poor Pyro Stinger, like, I mean, he's admitted the story, obviously, so he was okay with us running it, but he didn't find out until he announced it on the last episode that, oh yeah, we're going to be running it. So, sorry, buddy, we miscommunicated. Uh, we'll do better next time. No. So, you know, hopefully sorry, you're okay. Man. I mean, we're still reading your story, so hopefully it's a little okay. Well, we're still giving you attention, so it's okay <laughs> if we mistreat you a little bit. Yeah, it's okay for stupid idiots. Yeah, it's okay. It does make me feel bad. I know. So, so we, we apologize, you know, we're, we're bad and we should feel bad. But moving yeah. on. Um, you know, so we had this story. Well, and, and this story isn't straight, but you know, it's it's by. I mean, that's what that works. That's that's straight as enough. good, right? Yeah, for tunes, by is as good as straight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, they always say like, um, you only have to suck one dick to make it, to make you gay, but right. I always feel like, oh, it's not worth the other way around. Like, exactly. If, if I'm an avowed straight do- uh, gay dude, but if I come out like, oh no, like I had one mistake one night, and uh, one night I kind of liked it. You know, I like, think, oh, I think now, it, now you're by, now you're by. You I think it all by. becomes where you're starting from, you know? If, if you're if you're starting from, well, I'm straight, and then I, you know, suck the dude's dick, then, yeah, okay, maybe that's kind of gay. But if you're if you're gay and you're like, you know, I, I ate, uh, what did they call it, fragrant, uh, I'm trying to remember what the word is, you know, fragrant valley, something like uh, that, or yeah. something like that, you know, yeah. then, yeah, maybe it's like, dude, that's kind of straight, isn't it? Like, what the fuck, dude? Yeah, like, tunes like, is. Really dismissive yeah, but like, what do you think people would like start going? Like, dude, you must be straight, dude. Dude, you yeah, must you be must entire, be like, totally. This straight. gay thing's an entire put on. You just, yeah. you just really just want to be straight. You're well, just begging to eat. Where that is, I think, it, it, we've been joking about this, but I think where that happens actually is uh, lesbians, because there's that fear. Like, there's a whole, there's a whole. Well, every you know guy in a straight relationship, if he has sex with another guy. He's no longer bi. He's obviously turning gay. And right. with women, it seems to be the opposite. It's that, oh, you did something with a guy. You can't be bi. You're just straight, but you're, you know, messing around or whatever. And uh, I, I know I have friends who are lesbians, and it's this crazy, insane double standard. And I, I think it comes so from the fact... That's different. Interesting. Well, I think it's come from the fact that our society said, well, obviously, cock is irresistible. And so guys will leave women for cock, and women will leave women for cock. And it's, I think it's this crazy value that our culture has put on men and, and their genitals. So it, 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 but it plays out in kind of opposite ways in these stupid anti-bi biases. Prejudices. That's why I'm an ass man. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we yeah, all got well, that. Well, that's everybody, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, Everybody's got a nice ass. So why are you get, just gay, then? I got a bit of, like, the dick, too. See, now, nice too. See, now yeah, it's like, nice. oh, <laughs> see, okay, by that argument, you know. Yeah, but it's not the only thing. Uh-huh. I don't know. Sure. What can I say? Um, but yeah, we we get a buy story in, so that's kind of fun. We haven't done many of those. There aren't as many, you know. It's it's hard to find if you if you browse, you know, so far or whatever. There, there are definitely fewer than there are. But we got the cream of the crop. Here. I really like this one. You like this, this one? one's really good. Yeah. I thought. Well, what what do you like? What do you like about it? Why why are you so, why are you so enthralled with it? Well, well like, for, for one, the the setting was kind of. I think I said before the last time we did a um a prostitution story or however you want to call it. That mm-hmm. is kind of like my secret kink. The idea of like, mm-hmm. oh, I can sleep with someone in like in like a high powered, uh, position and get like tons and tons yeah, of money let's, for it. Let's talk about and that's that. That's kind a of like bit. I don't. That's like it's just the idea is alluring to me. Yeah. I don't know. Well, let's talk about that. Why are? Because I, I don't know, it's one of these things where, you know, I read one and I'm like, okay, you know, that was and hot, but that it's that not it's like a special the, thing. But it's kind of what the story's about. I mean, the, like, the whole thing's about secrets, and that's what kind yeah, of what it's about, it like, the power of secrets, uh, essentially. Well, is that, do you think, is that the main compelling reason why, I, I'm going to call them bordello stories, because I like the stories, word yeah. bordello. Um, but why, why are you Bordello stories always so popular? Because, I mean, I mean, you know, we're well, reading this, and I'm immediately thinking laziness. of... Right now, Kyle Gold, you know, obviously has in, involve all goes to ones, and then even as one of his short stories is, is set in a bridal. Um, Rukas is currently running on FA, and it's coming out in book. Uh, Red Lantern, right. which is set in a, right. a bordello, and and, you know, and I'm sure people can come up with tons of others. So, right. you know, why? what is it about bordello stories that's like, yeah, that's um, bordello. We all like bordello like, stories. Well, like I said, I'm going to go with creative creative laziness. It's just laziness. So what do you mean? Then? Because I, you know, it's it's just an easy concept to throw a bunch of you know sexual play into because it's That's clearly a highly a highly sexually charged arena, and it's drawn from real life because you know cat houses and mm-hmm. things like like harems exist in real life. But what about the kind of sex I, I, I would then ask that goes on? You know, over Dell. I mean, because it's a certain, you know, it's a commodified. Obviously, it's a business transaction. Yeah, are we really talking about it as a business, or about talking about it as a story? Because I don't think I want to defend, you know, sex work I, as a business. Wait, whoa, like whoa, whoa! I bring up some kind of Marxist interpretation of something, seeing it as a business and about commodification, and. Tunes doesn't want to think about no, it that way. It's not a Marxist thing. Wow, I mean, no, this no, no, is no, no. fucking crazy. I mean, it's, it's not like a Marxist thing. I mean, my my uh, econ teacher in a high school mm-hmm. who was teaching us from the N. Gregory Mankiw mm-hmm. textbook. You know, George mm-hmm. Bush's economic advisor. Mm-hmm. She used to joke, "What's the, what's the only business where um the." Labor investment is the capital investment. She's oh, it's prostitution. Ha 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 ha. Nice. I don't know, nice. something like that. But I don't, it's it's like everybody. It's I don't think anybody doesn't see it. As I, a I guess I, I, just, I, guess I don't just know. amazed that you of all people is wanting to forgo this discussion. I don't know if I want to forgo the discussion. I don't want to be mistaken as because so some people are for like this sexual liberalization mm-hmm. of sex work that I'm mm-hmm. more wary of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because you know, like in, in, there are certain jurisdictions in this country where well, sex work is or illegal. where Alex lives. Yeah, or where Alex and, lives. And, Khaki dog in, in Amsterdam. So, there you go. And I don't know, it's just one of those areas where my interest in, in gender equality com- mm-hmm. starts to bat up against my interest in um, general social mm-hmm. li- libertarianism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, maybe that's why I enjoy the, 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 the Bordello story, so to speak, is because maybe through this weird medium, I'm kind of working out how I feel about it. I don't know. That, I think there's something there, and we, this is something, obviously, we've touched on a lot of times in this show, as being, you know, furries, and, you know, it, it's kind of way of maybe, you know, exploring a, a, a kink or something that turns you on, or just something you're interested in or thinking about in a safe way. You know, you can explore it and mm-hmm. think about it in a way that nobody's getting exploited, or because it's just a furry story. Right. Uh, so, no, I think it, there's something to be said there. Um... I think it's interesting, too. One of the things I kind of appreciated about this story is a lot of the, you know, if there is a genre in the fandom of bordello stories, um, usually they end up turning into love stories or relationship stories in some way. How many of these have you read? Tons? I mean, there are a lot. I think it's a pretty common genre, even just in little throwaway things on Sofra. And like I said, there's some larger published ones. 
um, that are very popular, but they usually end up being, you know, kind of a relationship story or kind of turning in that way. I kind of feel like that's where Red Lantern maybe is going, you know, for instance, if we're talking about a current thing running. Um, And this is a story that explicitly doesn't do that. It doesn't get romantic. No. And I think that's one of the kinds of things to, that can be said in its favor. It does get romantic. The character is pretty much in love with himself. Yes, yes. I think that's one of the fun things. I mean, do, is think, that something you like about of, the story? I, I thought that was kind of the lesson of it, was that in this work you have to love yourself, because clearly mm. you can't find any support from anywhere. Because, mm. I, mean, uh, I mean, he's in dalliance with a very you know significant political player, apparently, mm. in this mm. city, and uh, the guy is clearly just ashamed to be seen in the same room with him. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's kind of like um, the opposite of having any kind of power or authority. Mm-hmm. You're actually kind of a um, liability. Mm-hmm. So it's it's more... I think that's just the lesson by the end of the story is the character understands that you kind of have to, to uh, uh, hold this power for yourself because people aren't going to maintain it for you. Yeah, I mean, and I think maybe that's... I mean, this guy's kind of an asshole, you know, but, because yeah, he's but, so full of... But you, I think you give a good reason why... You have to understand the context of, a context of him also is saying exactly. he's being kind of... He's kind of an outsider in this world. Exactly. And his just pre, uh, dispositions are looked at with a critical well, and, eye. And, and, and in having this kind of cocky... No pun intended... Or pun definitely intended, I'd say. Uh, attitude... Uh, as you said, you know, it, it helps him do his job, and it protects him, you know, right. it, it keeps him, it keeps him, you know, well paid, it keeps him safe, it gives him, you know, sets boundaries. And aside from that, I thought it was just really well written. I think yep. it's it's easy to just butcher a character that is supposed to sound kind of full of himself, because right. it's going to come off, like, underwhelming, actually, mm-hmm. more than mm-hmm. anything, but I think it's handled incredibly well in this story, in the, the um... The, the dialogue, the voice and the, and the dialogue specifically, because it's kind of, kind of that old, right. like, medieval sound right. to I it, mean, but it's got... not, like, eh, it's not over, overblown. Exactly, and I think that's that's a kind of great choice on Pirate Stinger's part, because we've sort of got, I mean, the, the setting isn't explicitly set in any time period, but kind of from the way people are talking, kind of say, well, it's maybe, you know, 17th century or 16th century or earlier. Um, you know, maybe. So it isn't explicitly, there aren't any explicit markers of a definite time period. And I think there's a lot, nothing in here that would contradict necessarily it being set in the present day, um, either for that matter. But, you know, kind of, at least I got the feeling, I'm picturing it in my head. You're trying to put a date a, into it? Yeah. I don't know, can you really try to put a date into the, if it's not trying to be specific well, I mean, about location, you're, I think you're, it's just the general idea of the past. Okay, so when we, when you are imagining the setting as it's being, you know, as people are talking about, where is it taking place in? I mean, what kind of environment? Fantasy world. Yeah, but what kind of, I mean... I wouldn't, I mean, since it's a fantasy world, I, I wouldn't mean, they're not in front of like They're on. not in front of, like, a, a white background, I assume. So this is interesting. I'm wondering what, I'm what goes some... on in your head as you put the scene together. When I'm, I, I, I'm generally just thinking of it in terms of just the past, vaguely, mm-hmm. and... So I feel in that way it's supposed to be a commentary on our past, but you wouldn't want to make a direct connection because you would say that the uh, presentation gives you a sense of maybe the 16 or 1700s. I don't know. It seems, mm-hmm. but it seems more like what it's commenting on wouldn't be that time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it seems like the commentary here is more on. Uh, I don't want to like say boil it down to like racial issues, but mm-hmm. that's kind of like what's being mm-hmm. uh, evoked here mm-hmm. by his uh, uh, message of being a, a, an immigrant to the land, of mm-hmm. being uh, kind of looked out, uh, looked down on, and so on. Right. That's not an issue we're, that we're trying to identify with, like our history mm-hmm. necessarily right away in like the 16 or 1700s when people are using this language. That's something we'd be identifying more in like the. Um, well, I think that's a, you know, that's I'm a good argument. I think I'm I'm wanting to go there because I, you just want to be too specific. Well, I'm wanting to go there. I think because I've done so much. I have so much you know, history in my background, and you know, taken so many history classes and studied but you're a so stickler. much stuff. No and I read on history. My no, no, I think, I, like I said, I think you made a really good point. You know, is that you could just kind of accept it as this is a past. 
Yeah. And that's is as close as it needs to be. And I think and I feel a really like good you, argument you have the that counterbalance to that when you, you talk about the future sometimes. Like, I don't want to say, oh, this is clearly technology that's, you know, estimated to be coming into existence around 100 yeah. years in the future. No. It's like, no, this is just like our vague interpret, like, projection right. into what our future state well, that's, is. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's the difference, I think, between hard, you know, what's called, you used to have, you still run into them, these sticklers for hard sci-fi. Where everything has to be with, you know, extrapolated at least mm. from the realms of current technology. But just a standard you know, language. It's so, like, anal retentive in some ways. Yeah. So I understand. Like, and you get the same people who are very anal retentive about um, the language being very precise. So, mm-hmm. if, like, if someone were, were to try to tackle mm-hmm. this kind of language and you were to try to date it to a specific time, mm-hmm. it would open it up to criticism. Like, Absolutely. oh, they're, they're, they're not talking in the well, exact. I think, and it seems like, like that's missing the point in the yeah, first place. I agree. Place, so well, why? I think Pyro Stinger deals with that effectively in two ways. Is one is. Right, it, it's sort of a past, you know, but it's not a specific place or time on Earth that we can, you know, explicitly connect it to. Um, two is this florid speech mm-hmm. matches our protagonist's personality. It really kind of paints his personality. Exactly. In the so you know, one is always story. left saying, "Well, there's this florid speech that is probably setting a kind of time tone." If you will, but it's also floored because that's how he, th- that you know, that's how he wants to present himself, yeah. and so you can kind of read it in this double way, and I think it's very effective because of that. You know, dealing with this weird issue of well, how do I make it sound old timey? And he kind of heads off any argument where he somebody could say, well, it didn't you know this wasn't accurate? And he's like, but that's how this guy talks because he's <laughs> yeah. full of himself. Yeah, um, and, and the other and characters so don't really quite like talk it. like that. The other characters don't quite talk. Like no, they that. don't. I mean, he's definitely more over the top in, in kind of his speech style yeah, than anybody ornate. else. Yeah, obviously. Um, and and, and it, I think we can read it from his person as an affectation. Uh, and he probably feels he has to talk like that because he's dealing in the realm of these highly influential mm-hmm. people who probably carry the same professional manner of speech in their daily lives. And they, Either you know, or he, he thinks he, they do. They probably do. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. If if he's, if he's you know mimicking upper class speech, these are mm-hmm. upper class people. He's he's dealing with. I mean, like, uh, and I like, the, but I very much like the kind of the political mm-hmm. tone of the story, and it's mm-hmm. not explicit in any way. But just you know, the setting. I just like the setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the the only spot I mean I, I I it really worked well for me. I the ending leaves me a little flat. Really? Yeah. I thought it was perfect. Really. Why do you think it was perfect? Well, I thought it was perfect because the sex scene was so long and great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a good sex yeah, scene. Yeah, the, the, the reason that creates a difficulty in terms of ending it is mm-hmm. how, 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 do you, how do you wrap up a sex scene? Yeah. Like, I mean, especially if that's all, if that's really all it boiled down to the characters doing was fucking and you just wanted to get, you know, you wanted the reader to enjoy characters mm-hmm, fucking. Mm-hmm. What significant event can you really come up with to kind of na- naturally segue into an ending beyond them just like kind of coming and rolling over? But yeah. so what he has kind of this natural segue where uh, his father is is right. in the building, and it's not. I, just, I don't think they're implying he's looking for him. I, right. I think he's looking for service. Right. But clearly, what to be they don't found, want him to run into each other. Yeah, Absolutely. And so it kind of provides a natural segue out of the um, out of the scene while highlighting the the themes that have been you know addressed prior to the, the sex mm-hmm. in the first place. But I'd actually want to talk about just I thought the the sex scene itself was probably or definitely among the best we've we've mm-hmm. featured uh-huh. on the podcast. Okay. And just the, the, the imagery, just how like uh wide the 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 the, the, the sensual scene was. I, I get I am irritated because stories uh, get to be written almost as if you're watching them on TV, and all they have to describe is what the character, where you can see right. the characters doing, what you can hear the characters doing, right. and they forget that in real life you smell and right. like feel and, and even taste especially things especially remember too. in this particular community, if you're writing furries, if you're writing animals with huge noses on their faces, yeah, you definitely got to work that stuff in. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And it, and it definitely just takes a story to another because that's what mm-hmm. you're really the sensual experience. It's, you, yeah, it's you're touch trying to and, write and smell. Right, you should be taste. writing your pulp as right. uh, yeah. as if you know you're there, or you know as your reader is you know, in the protagonist moment, not 
watching the protagonist have sex on TV. Yeah. I That's not you what you're be, writing. You want to be evocative. Exactly. That's well, what you and you do. don't want to. I think you're right. Is that you know, depending on how what how we consume our porn, um, you know, if we're used to this, you know, just watching videos or whatever, it's easy to fall into. And and we all think about movies and TV shows, and so it's easy to write your story as if it's going to be well, on it's TV. Pri- uh, yes, the primary media we mm-hmm. all consume. consume. If you mm-hmm. just think about it, it's kind of kind of got to drive our, our mm-hmm. thinking. You really got to combat that. Yeah. Well, you've got to remember that each media has their particular strengths and weaknesses, and you can't do the exact same thing. You can't tell the story the exact same way in two different mediums. No, you can't. Um, and, and I think so, that's especially... You know, think about, right, if you're sitting on a right, think about this is a written story, and there are things that I can do that can't be done on TV, and mm-hmm. I should do them. And that, that is one reason I enjoy writing Pulp, is because mm-hmm. I think sex is one of those things. Is like... I never enjoyed watching porn mm-hmm. because, I mean, for one, just this, the, the experience. Of, we talked about this last yeah, time. Yeah, we did. Yeah. The but fake. A, the, the fakeness of it. And, like, yeah. and, like, and just the fact you can only see and you can only really hear what they're doing. Right. I mean, you can't move the camera. That's what always gets me. It's like, well, I'd, I'd like to be, and if I'm reading you know, a story, looking over there, but I can't move the camera. It's not like it's any less fake if I'm reading right. a story. I mean, it's still just sensual perception mm-hmm. in my head, but mm-hmm. at least it's like playing to my my my... Uh, sense of touch, my, right. my taste, my my smell. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and, and even, things even, that you can't convey as easily in the visual medium. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If I'm just watching like a um, a business drama, that's probably not as important. I don't think. Mm-hmm. No, I can just watch that shit on TV. Yeah, but I mean, it's like right. You know, we a lot of people, you know, like having sex with the lights off. Well, good luck. You know, I mean, <laughs> you can't film a porn with the lights off. Unless you get like, everybody's green, you know, because they're like night cameras. Or they, or they like being blindfolded while they're being. Yeah, and like, so think about can't... it. If people are, you know, maybe that's even something. I mean, maybe that's a device you could try using if you're like, okay, I've got this scene. Is it right? And then say, okay, how could you imagine f- how I could describe this scene if I was blindfolded? Yeah. And think about it that way, maybe. You know, yeah. okay, I've written it all out. Everything happens. How would I tell it if I, you know, how would I describe it to somebody who's blindfolded? Or how would someone who was blindfolded experience, experience it? Experience it. Yeah, you're right. Experience, I think, is a better word. Oh, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, I don't know. I guess the 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 ending, I don't know. I yeah, I think you're right. It's like, how do, how do I end this? And I guess for me, it was like, it was an okay ending, but it wasn't, it didn't wow me. You know, I don't know what? if there was a... What did you want? I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, I thought that the little line about, or, I mean, I thought, once again, I thought it fit into the personalities, because he's kind of, you know, chortling at Jin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, it's all about secrets, and... and I think you would have wanted him to do something heroic, like go out there and just insist that he come out to his dad no. and initiate like a queer no. ruling kingdom. No. no, you don't think that's it. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I was just—it's something I think I'd have to, uh, you know, ponder a little. It wasn't a bad ending, but I don't know if it was. Maybe it just seems sort of conflicting because ending. it reinforces the concept of the closet hmm. in the ending. Because hmm. that's essentially what it's doing. Is it's well, this is an interesting case where you know normally we we kind of think about things like the closet in some ways as um, it, it's weird because and this is something good to remember is that things like the closet and these some a lot of these social restrictions they affect people in the middle in a lot of ways. The people at the bottom, like a prostitute, don't have anything to lose. They don't care. Right. You know, and the people at the top who are, you know, fantastically wealthy. I mean, this guy's obviously wealthy, but he's not the lord. You know, he's he's still dependent right. on his father to, you know, who could disown him or whatever. Um, and people at the top who have don't have anything to lose because they have everything. And they don't care. Right. Um, so it's anybody with, who's in a position where they could actually lose something. That's who it affects. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that's interesting. So in this weird way... Our our, our uh, prostitute protagonist ha- has this degree of freedom over his client in 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 this one particular area, and I would not say in general yeah. because I, I would not dare make that argument. But in this one little area, and that's kind of one of the things that maybe is compelling thinking about about these bordello stories is that they're moments where a space is created where there can be an inversion like yeah, they, in they power can, dynamics 
Which you clearly don't see in real life. And you clearly see it, but I mean, you do. I Isn't mean, here, you know, and even, even he's the one that does the rhino, so it's enacted out in this particular masculinist way. But anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a potential for weird reversals of roles in power mm-hmm. dynamics. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I think people probably go see Prozzi. It's a weird reversal of roles and dynamics well, see, that, that they the can't enact isn't... out. <laughs> We shouldn't be encouraging people to go see prostitutes. No, I'm wear. not. I'm not. You know, I've never seen one, but I'm just, you know, talking about these things. I just, I've know, read I just, a lot. I, I read the, um, like the Washington Blade and uh-huh. the Metro Weekly, and I was looking uh-huh. in the back, and the escort ads are always there. Uh-huh. And I always want to, like, look at the eye candy, but I, I think, have oh, a, wait, I had a friend in my World of Warcraft guild that was an escort for a male escort for a while. Hmm. Um, and, I mean, he was, he was like, you know, a posh one, and it would be like, you know, one time it was, they brought along in their, you know, jet as they flew across the country, and you know, that kind of thing. But didn't you, didn't you see, the, like, the recent breaking story just in the area where, like, an L.A. County gang was trying to recruit underage women for uh, sex yeah. work, yeah. like, in Fairfax County? Yikes. This shit happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I really don't think and you have to. It, oh, it's, yeah. it's necessary to create that separation of space oh, yeah, because that's absolutely. when that's how you maintain like the understanding that it's. Mm-hmm. Well, like I said, that's why it's a good it's world. a good medium here to do furry porn to kind of think about and, or get this kink out of your system because you know <laughs> nobody's being exploited. Yeah, like that fictional fox is being real. Oh yeah, keep exploiting that fox. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't. I don't think anyone was was abducting anybody to take them to. A, to a furry convention. Well, now that we think about it, that could be kind of fun. Well, what? Don't. <laughs> that'll, that'll look good that's, on the news. That's awful. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we've got, well, we've got a few, I don't know, you have anything else to add? It was a good story. Oh, I liked it. It was just a, it was just, you know, short and, and fun and really good porn scene. This is my said. kind of story. I thought yeah. that was great. Yeah. And we got a buy story, so I was excited about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was awesome. So thank you, Pyro Stinger. Uh, sorry about the little miscommunication there reaching you. I think we each thought the other had done it, so uh, our apologies. We'll, we'll try to Hopefully you'll again. send us another one and, and, and take pity on us. I um, hope so. We've got a few more things coming on along in the pipeline. I know. Uh, we've got, um, I think... Uh, White Yodi has another story some point in the future that Buck Hopper recorded, and then we have Buck Hopper as a couple stories that we'll have somebody to record. Um, we're always looking for more things. I had uh, somebody I need to get back to them who, who volunteered to record, so we're always looking for volunteer readers as well. Uh, so, you know, I've got, to go, got a few things to go through, but we're always looking for more submissions. We're always looking for more readers, drop us line and skip at baddogbooks.com and you're... Mm-hmm. And you are... I'm Tunces. At, you want to give me your email address? Because it's on the website anyway. It's very helpful of you to cue me. Thank you. I do appreciate I, I it. To come back, to, come you, back to, the, to, the, to the first thing we said in the episode, I did kind of drift there for a bit. Yeah. I'm um, Tunces at drivingcat.org. Okay. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Pointing, pointing, pointing. Okay. I was trying to think of something to say because I saw you, you were signing off. I think, oh, I should think, is there anything I want to say? Oh, okay, gotcha. Well, we can, you know. uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, about does it this week. We've got some good things coming down the pipeline in the future. Uh, we've got some big changes here. You know, I, I'm starting a new job today. Good in show. fact, when you guys have heard this, I will have already started it. So mm-hmm. that's exciting. It should be more money and should hopefully be more cons in the future. Too. So I've got to obviously earn some vacation days, and so we'll be at Rocky Mountain. But other than that, you know, they'll probably have to wait till next year. Um, and then you know, the you've got you've got go some things going on. So I voted. You voted, yep, and and you've got some you know interesting you know job leads and doing some other work, and so uh, things things are exciting here in DC. I gotta go check the gumball machines. Got to go check the gumball. Yeah, we're gonna go do that right now. <laughs> we gotta go. Check uh, Tunes' gumball machine empire here. <laughs> so uh, I think that about does it. And we'll see you guys uh, in a couple weeks. Yep. Arrivederci. Bye.